All right. Welcome to another episode of The Fundable Founder. I'm here today with Anvesh Gurujala, who is one of the co-founders of Boston Materials. Welcome, Anvesh. Thanks for having me, Charlie. It's uh, really great to have you on. I think you have a good story to tell, uh, especially because you know, you're in more of a deep tech uh, category where it can be a little bit more challenging to raise money than if you were B2B software. So mm-hmm. we'll get into that in a minute. But first, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about Boston Materials. What's your elevator pitch? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you our, uh, our quick elevator pitch. Um, if we look at the vision for Boston Materials, really it's to transform and significantly decarbonize both transportation and electronics industries. So I know that's kind of a mile high, my mile high view. So if we kind of look into specifics, how we accomplish that is with a uh, technology called Z-axis carbon fiber, which is kind of our patented and exclusive technology. What we're doing is we're taking uh, end of life and uh, basically scrap carbon fiber uh, from the supply chain in the industry. Uh, and we have a proprietary process to apply the fiber as a coating. And in the coating process, we actually align the fibers standing up in the z-axis so the material we make looks like carbon fiber velvet or or velour and the benefit of that is we're extracting uh, electrical mechanical thermal properties from this otherwise uh, landfill bound material Uh, and so it's a high performance material made from scrap and so it's a very high gross margin uh, opportunity uh, for the company and the applications uh, range anywhere from, you know, thermal management and EMI shielding for electric vehicles yep. uh, to mechanical reinforcements for airplanes. And uh, we actually are selling products even into skis for vibration reduction. Oh, cool. So it's a lot of a lot of exciting applications uh, for the uh, the core business of the company. Yeah, I've never heard you describe it as carbon fiber, velvet, or velour, though. Before that's, that's, what it, that's what it looks like. Yeah, it is. Yeah, no, I've 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 held it in my hand. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, you guys, you know, what's your background? Why did you decide to start get into entrepreneurship and start this business? What's your origin? Yeah, so the origin story, I think we'd have to go back to 2015, where uh, Mike Siegel, one of the founders, and uh, me, we were. Uh, wrapping up our undergrad in mechanical engineering at Northeastern University. Yep. For our senior year capstone project, we uh, teamed up with uh, Dr. Randy Erb at Northeastern, uh, and he basically had this exciting technology to align particles using magnetic fields, and yep. he wanted a way to scale up his research. And so through that project, Mike and I figured out a way to basically create a piece of equipment that allowed him to scale up his uh, uh, research work. and. During that development, we kind of had an idea, like this could actually be implemented in an industrial scale, roll-to-roll manufacturing process, and we could make our own unique type of materials, composite materials, such as a Z-axis carbon fiber product. And so with kind of like that rough idea in mind, uh, we started Boston Materials in January of 2016. And five years later, we're now in industrial scale production. We have a 37,000 square foot facility uh, in Billerica, Massachusetts, and uh, we have products uh, selling to customers right now. So obviously there are a lot of steps in between, uh, but that's kind of how Boston Materials uh, originally started. Was there anything along that journey that caused you to really say, you know what, there's a real business here? Was there some, was there like a customer or an advisor or someone who was like, oh, I think you're onto something? And Yeah, there's, I think one person really comes to mind. Um, it was, uh, his name is Gary Sharpless. He's actually on our board of directors today, but right. he's been in the carbon fiber industry for, you know, 30, maybe almost 40 years at this point. Um, and, you know, he was, looking at ways to use carbon fiber to improve Z-axis properties throughout his whole career. And when we first met him, it was at some chapter meeting in Boston. Um, His first response was like, no way, (laughs) (laughs) you you can't work. So we actually had him come to uh, our, call it garage. Uh, It was actually an incubator space at Northeastern University in Burlington, Mass. Um, And we kind of showed him what we were working on. And, you know, he was telling us things about the composites industry that we just, there's no way for us to learn other than talking to someone else. And he basically said, this is legit. Like you guys have something here. Obviously you need to scale it up 
and grow the team and things like that. But the, the core is here. And for us, getting that validation from someone who's been in the composites industry for that long of time and kind of seen everything, um, that was a big That's job. incredible. Yeah. Talk about, yeah, that's, that's incredible validation and gives you the confidence to go launch a business. But, but at the same time, you probably were resource constrained and had other job opportunities. Was it a difficult decision to jump into entrepreneurship? Um, well, to be honest, for Mike and I, this was our first job out of college. Yeah. So that part wasn't too hard. We didn't know what the other option was. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, you know, we were bootstrapping Boston Materials by doing some contract development work for okay. a few companies. Uh, so we had uh, enough revenue, I guess, to keep the lights on. But, you know, we were basically still, it was very much a bootstrapped environment. Um, but it was around 2018 when we applied for a Mass TEC Catalyst grant. Yep. Uh, we were, uh, we presented to, uh, you know, the panel um, review board and, we met someone, his name is Jeff Weiss. Uh, he was part of Clean Energy Venture Group. And, you know, after talking to him, he's like, you should really talk to Clean Energy Venture Fund. Uh, they're now just known as Clean Energy Ventures. Yep. And so we kind of like talked to CED, Clean Energy Ventures, and they're like, this would be a great opportunity for us to potentially invest in Boston Materials and really take us from a bootstrapped, deep tech, you know, materials company with just an idea to actually implementing this commercially at scale. So that was kind of, I would say the real turning point for Boston materials, you know, like we were founded in 2016, but the story really started, I would say in like January of 2019. So you, so you bootstrapped for two to three years. Yeah. What did you feel like, what did you accomplish over those two or three years that got clean energy, clean energy ventures interested? I think for us, you know, like most deep tech companies and technologies, um, it's a platform technology. So it could have been applied to any type of material. So really understanding what industry we're gonna focus on and then what market segments we're gonna focus on and then what sub segments and then what are the products that we would actually need to develop. Yep. That I think, took two to three years for us. Okay. Just understanding exactly where we were going to start. Because it's such a, you know, if we look at lightweight materials, it's a $130 billion market. Right. Composites, 20, uh, you know, 25 billion, you know, aerospace, 8 billion. Like yeah. that's such, they're so nebulous, you know, like where do you actually start? So, we so how did you make that market. determination? How did you narrow it down? You just, we were, we went to conferences. Uh, we talked to potential customers, even though we didn't have a product, you know, we were just talking and, you know, as you're getting feedback, it becomes pretty obvious what is possible, what is not possible, what's going to take seven years, what's going to take two years. And you kind of just follow the path of least resistance. And, you know, for us, I'll admit we had some support, um, we received a uh, phase one SBIR from the National Science Foundation. So that actually gave us some funding to, you know, start developing a product and then testing the, call it the MVP with potential customers right. and kind of tinkering back and forth. And, you know, two years later, we kind of had a good starting place and a good kind of plan on how we're going to commercialize this technology. So you got the SBIR funding before the Mass CEC Catalyst grant or about the same time? Yeah, about the same time. Yeah. Okay. So tell us a little bit about how you went about winning an SBIR award. I mean, that's there's a lot of people out there who would love to know the secrets of winning an SBIR award. It's a great government program, a yeah. lot of money, allows you to get to proof of concept and talk to customers. Did you have a strategy around that um, or did you just wing it? <laughs> uh, I want to say we winged it, but I think we internally like with subconsciously had a strategy, right? So we, we had a good storyline on like how this technology could be used for wind turbine blades. Yeah. And, I remember that part of your story. So we structured the whole entire SBIR about, we want to develop this technology further to look at how this could be used in wind turbine blades. And by the way, here are 20 customers that we talked in other market segments that think this is uh, a viable technology. And then, and so we submitted, we didn't have any expectations because it was our first kind of SBIR grant. But when we received, you know, 
notification that the review committee like had like basically 40 questions for us to answer. You know, that was exciting because they were really, it, it was, I mean, they're hard questions, but they were pointed, you know, they, they yeah. were trying to steer us in a certain direction. And through answering those questions, we actually refined our business model and our business vision a little bit better. So um, it was a great process for us to really just the act of applying. That's great. And you've since gone on to win an SBIR phase two, if I'm correct. Yeah, that's right. So we won the phase two and a phase two B and then okay. some uh, supplemental funding from Mass DUC as well tied to the phase two. So um, I would say once we received the phase one award, we built a very good relationship with our program manager. Um, I hear that's the key to the SBIR program is, is yeah. really build a relationship with that program manager. And it's, it's not just to win the phase two, of course. Right, it's, right. These are experts in commercializing deep tech uh, technologies. Uh, so, um, so how much non-dilutive funding have you raised approximately? Approximately around 1.5, 1.75 million in non-dilutive uh, funding great. from uh, NSF mostly and some also from Mass CEC. That's awesome. And then, so um, then you went out to raise a seed round, correct? Yeah. So then, so around the time we received the uh, SBIR phase one, uh, we closed our um, seed round with Clean Energy Ventures and a small investment from Sobic Ventures as well. So that was a 1.75 million seed round. So so that round, I mean, you got in touch with uh, Clean Energy Ventures through Mass CEC. Yeah. Uh, did Clean Energy Ventures just issue a term sheet right away, or did you have to go out and and start pitching around the circuit and and find other investors? So we actually, um, you know, before we got connected with CEV, uh, we actually were doing some soft pitching uh, to potential okay. investors. We actually did have a term sheet um, that we decided not to move forward on. Uh, you know, for us at that point, like we weren't too hung up on valuations. We were really hung up on finding a good partner to work with. And, you know, that's what we were hesitant about was just like going and take, accepting our first term sheet. We just wanted to make sure it was someone we could foresee working with for the next five, seven years. And so with Clean Energy Ventures, it was kind of immediately obvious that they would okay. be great growth partners. And so we didn't, you know, when we had the first conversation, it, I don't know, it felt like there's some chemistry and it, uh, is it you know, because you were both kind of these mission driven organizations? I mean, you started off describing your company to me yeah. as, you know, this, um, you know, as your, as your mission, um, yeah, mission, mission driven, but also kind of, uh, I would say pragmatic on what it takes to accomplish that uh, mission and really team oriented. You know, obviously uh, anyone who has spent two years working on technology and trying to scale it up, you know, the technology works for some, you know, it, there's some bones that work, right? You're not going to be spending two years on something that just can't work. Right, right. Um, so at that point, the real emphasis was on kind of what, can the team accomplish and not necessarily who's on the team today, but like what type of team can the existing team build? Um, and that's something that they really prioritized. And that's, that's something great. that really resonated well with us. That's great. Um, so any kind of lessons learned through the fundraising process that you'd like to share with our audience, especially those that might be thinking about, you know, a deep tech type company that's kind of a, you know, started in academia and then they're, to, we decided there's, you know, a market opportunity and raise yeah. some grant funding and then some seed funding. What were, what were some of the big lessons learned for you that you can pass along to others? Um, I think the biggest lesson we learned is uh, at the end of the day, as a founder, uh, this is our business that we're trying to scale. We're working with this, you know, every day. It's on our mind all the time. But obviously we don't know everything. And there are people, especially for younger founders, uh, we don't know much at all about building a business. So you have to rely on people who have done it before to kind of learn from their successes and their mistakes. 
But at the same time, you need to know when to push back and when to say, this is how I want to build my business. And kind of threading that needle without being too arrogant or being a pushover is kind of, uh, I think, the hardest thing, but also the, probably the biggest thing that you can do uh, uh, as, a, yeah. as a founder. I mean, yeah. It's tremendous advice, right? Especially for first time founders, people who haven't, don't have a ton of business experience in general, right? Is, is recognize that you don't know a lot, right? And yeah. admit that you don't know much, but that you're seeking out advice, but then filtering that advice and saying, you know what, I'm the one who understands the technology. I'm the under the one who's been talking to all the customers. I have, you know, based on all of that assessment, I, I think this is the correct path to go listen to everybody else about how to go down that path. But like you said, kind of balance that intellectual curiosity and, and knowledge gain with making decisions that you think are right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's, yeah. you know, that's what we look for in entrepreneurs all the time at the seed stage is just that, that combination of intellectual curiosity, good decision-making, uh, but also just kind of that passion to go after, uh, the passion about what they're doing. Right. And you see that in a lot of mission driven organizations, people who, who start with that mission. So mm -hmm. I can see why uh, clean energy ventures was attracted to the opportunity, not just the opportunity, but the team and, and your skill set. And I, I think it's the same reason why we were attracted to them. Right. Yep. Uh, they mirrored exactly how we wanted to build an organization. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And any lessons learned that you carried on into the next fundraise that, you know, you think, You'd like to share uh, with the audience on that? Yeah, I mean, we're still raising our Series A right now, so okay. we haven't completed it yet. But you know, things that I'm learning is that um, you, you know how to thread that needle between being realistic on what you can accomplish, but also being optimistic and selling the vision of the company. You obviously don't want to lean in either direction too much. If you lean towards too optimistic, you, you can lose credibility, especially as a you know first time entrepreneur. Right. But also if you're not really selling the potential vision, then you're going to get undervalued and maybe even passed over. Um, and that's what we're just starting to learn is how do we best deliver that pitch? I mean, if I look at my pitch decks, I think we're on like version 60 by now. <laughs> and so it's always like, um, you know, you're, you're correcting one way or another, but you eventually have to find that kind of uh, best way to, uh, to, uh, to sell your vision uh, effectively and credibly. And I, I think the reality is like fundraising for us, it's never been a single event. It's been a continuum. Um, you know, when we closed our series seed funding, obviously we kind of put our head down a little bit and focused on commercializing and scaling the technology. But I think we were still some level pitching to investors, even though we're not really raising capital. But even when we started getting to the mindset, yes, we want to raise our Series A, it took almost like six months, eight months to kind of get the ball rolling. And, you know, obviously the pandemic didn't help, but like yeah. it took time to kind of get the pitch crafted. And I, even now, even after doing this for a while, um, on a week to week basis, my the pitch still morphs, you know, as you get input and feedback. So I think just, you kind of have to be open to that uh, uh, evolution. Yeah. You've touched on a lot of themes that we hear from a lot of uh, fundable founders. And, you know, that's, it's kind of, um, I think one of the things that one, another founder told me is, you know, you really need to not just craft your pitch book, but craft your pitch, depending on who the audience is, right? So yeah. some yeah. care mostly about the vision and less about how you're going to get there. And others want to know exactly how you're going to get there and who your, who your market is and who your target customer is and how you're going to get there. So yeah. you have to mirror the investor's interest as well, right? And so you might actually yeah. have two or three pitch books. One's, one that explodes with the vision right off the first page that says, you know, I think you gave the number of $120 billion market, right? And, and you can be in every lightweight material segment out there. Yeah. Um, but there's others that might say, hey, look, we've nailed this market and we're going to get to the vision of $120 billion dollar market place at the end. And so um, yeah. part of it is, is figuring out who your audience is too. And one thing we've learned kind of is that even sometimes within the same firm, yes, <laughs> there are people that take on both. So like, I think 
at the end of the day, like the pitch that we have right now, it's like a, it's honest, you know, like this is a vision and we work down on how we can actually accomplish that in the next two to three years and yep. beyond. So, um, you know, there's a level of honesty that we're trying to kind of present. That's uh, awesome. And we'll, <laughs> we'll see if it works out, you know, cause we're still raising. So. Yeah. Well, good yeah. luck with that raise. Um, yeah. We're just about out of time. Did we not, t is there any last piece of advice or wisdom that we didn't touch on? Um, I mean, I think wisdom or kind of just common sense fact is that at the end of the day, this whole fundraising and building a business in an organization, uh, it's all about people. Yep. Um, so, you know, how you treat people and how they treat you, it kind of all matters in that's one thing I really learned is, you know, sometimes it's easy to get stuck in spreadsheets and pitch decks and whatever. But at the end of the day, you're trying to build a relationship with someone, whether it's a investor, employee, customer, mentor. Um, so Definitely. great, yeah. great words of wisdom. Um, I like to finish by asking uh, one final question, and that's how would you describe yourself in one word? Oh, that's a hard question. I think, uh, Maybe doer. Doer. Um, okay. I, you know, personally, I, I get anxious if I'm making a plan and I can't, you know, do it. Yep. Uh, and, you know, part of, you know, raising a series A is you're building out, out all these models and forecasts and, you know, what could happen. And it's exciting to see. And you know, sometimes I get restless, you know, that, okay, I just want to raise the series A so I can actually do it. Um, yep, exactly. Yeah. Well, good. Well, good luck just doing it. Um, yeah. Good luck with the finalizing the raise, and I'm really looking forward to watching your progress over the next couple of years. Thank you for joining us today, Avesh. Yeah, thank you, Charlie. To innovate, invent, and disrupt, we're your partner to fuel your growth. Contact us to learn more.